How does this work? Okay. Is that okay? Right. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, good. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. My name's Caroline, Caroline Knowles. I'm the communications manager of Young Lives. I'd like to really welcome you to the conference. We're delighted that everybody's here. Um, well, not everybody quite has arrived yet. We've got about 20% of people who haven't arrived yet, it seems, but hopefully they'll come during the day. So if anybody can move along rows so that there's a seat at the end, that will be helpful to, so latecomers can come in. Thank you. Okay. Right, okay, I want to just welcome everybody very much to Lady Margaret Hall. We're delighted to be here at Lady Margaret Hall because it was one of the first women's colleges here in Oxford, so it's great to be having a gender conference here. Um, we've already written to you, this is a lovely um, venue to be at and we want this to be a lively and engaging conference. We think we've got a great programme together, all your presentations and the things you've brought with you look fantastic, so um, we're hoping this will be a space for discussion, debate, reflection and for you to make it what you will. Um, there was, you've all got a copy of the programme, there are three things that I wanted to draw to your attention. First of all, this evening, at, um, at the end of the day, we're very pleased to be welcoming Charlotte Watts, who's the Chief Scientist at the Department of International Development, and I would encourage you to come and hear her speak. We're going to be doing a, a slightly reflective interview with her about what it's like to be a senior academic and a senior policymaker, so I think that'll be quite interesting. Um, on a different, a different scale of things, we thought we couldn't have a conference about youth without inviting some young people. And we're delighted to have some young um, youth ambassadors from Oxfam. We have a long-term relationship with Oxfam. We work with them on some education materials. And um, so we're working with the Oxfam education team. And there will be, I think, six or eight young people arriving a little bit later today to talk to people and to see what we're doing and to learn a bit more about our work. So please do, if you meet them, please do engage with them. And finally, another thing about engagement, we have got with us today a scribe. We've got a, a wonderful artist who's going to draw our proceedings as we go to help us reflect on what we're doing. And to help her to do that, if you have an idea or something you would like to contribute to her, please do go and talk to her. We've also asked our research assistants to take notes in the parallel sessions of anything really interesting they, they hear so they can, they can also feed back for her, to her. But please do go and engage with her. And then very finally, one thing I must um, talk to you about is fire regulations, fire escapes, which is something we have to do. If by any chance there is a fire, we're not expecting a drill. If there is a fire when we're in the lecture theatre, please go over to the second quadrangle, not this quadrangle here, the second one over, and gather there. Everybody should gather there. If there's a fire or a fire drill when we're in the in the, the, the parallel sessions, go to the gardens at the back of the college. There will be plenty of the Young Lives team around to show you where to go. If you, if you, so just follow Young Lives staff, but please head to the back of the college. Okay, so now I will hand over to Jo. I hope it won't happen, by the way. I'm sure it won't happen. I'm sure it won't. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Jo, who's the director of Young Lives, to uh, welcome you formally to the conference. Hello everybody, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here to sunny Oxford, for once sunny Oxford, um, and to Lady Margaret Hall. Um, it's very impressive, we have 170 or more participants, unfortunately we had to turn quite a lot of people away, so we're really excited, not just by the number of people who've come here to engage with topics that we think to be really fundamental, but also the diversity of our participants is amazing as well. So people have come from all corners of the world and with many diverse forms of experience of both research, policy and practice. Um, one of the objectives of this conference was to ensure that we had good debates around gender, adolescence and youth, and that those debates were really useful um, for policy, but in particular were informed by experience and insights from the global south. So much of the debate, I think, currently and in the past has been dominated by thinking from the global north. We want to start by acknowledging the children and young people who are at the heart of all of our work, the, their experiences, their contributions, and the patience that they very often show with us in terms of respond, being, responding to our research questions and so on. I think that's really important for all of us as a basic principle. And just to say that Young Lives has been following 12,000 children um, in four study countries, Ethiopia, 
uh, India, Peru, and Vietnam uh, for almost 15 years now. Um, very sadly, um, a young lives child died uh, this week in a traffic accident in Peru, and it's, it's a very, very personal shock to all of us. We were actually in the field at the time. I just wanted to highlight what it means for all of us to be engaging in long-term relationships with these very brave and courageous young people. Um, and I know that you all share with Young Lives this really central commitment to bring the voices of young people to the table in research, in policy and in practice. I can't think of a better place for us to be holding this conference. Caroline has already said that Lady Margaret Hall was um, one of the uh, early founding um, colleges for women in Oxford. But much more than just that... Um, it is a, a centre for uh, international gender studies. There's a really powerful group of, of people here who are engaging long-term on a wide range of gender issues. They're, they're taking part in this, in this conference, I'm very pleased to say. But also, Eglantine Jeb, who many of you may know about, is an alumni of Lady Margaret Hall. Eglantine Jeb was an amazing advocate for children, uh, very bravely... Uh, basically supported uh, children on all sides of the conflict during the First World War, was arrested and imprisoned for her, um, for her action and her activism. She's a she was a founder of Save the Children Fund, but also fundamentally um, she was the author of the Geneva Declaration of the Rights of the Child, which is what subsequently really became the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So she's probably the, the, the most important person really in, in terms of generating our whole field. The content of the conference has been designed uh, very much to focus not just on gender, but on generation, which, which are key organizing and structuring principles in all societies throughout the world. They, they determine access to power, to resources, nature of relationships and experiences, um, and experiences of exploitation, violence, and abuse. And so we felt that bringing those two key principles together was absolutely um, fundamental. But it's also, I think, important to highlight that in, in the past, that most of the generational research has been focused on adults and children. So we really wanted to highlight adolescence and youth and the learning that we need to take out into the wider world in terms of, of, of research evidence for policy and practice, learning that can be used to more effectively support and, and reflect on the demands and needs and, and so on of what is currently the world's largest generation, the largest generation of young people the world has ever seen, and the largest probably that we will ever see, given current demographic changes. Um, so we're wanting to see what it is that's specific about these particular generations, adolescence and youth, that makes it very different from childhood and adulthood. Um, we would argue that this is a time absolutely crucial for the, the rise of gender disparities and for the emergence of, of, of powerful um, gender norms and values. It's at this point in, the, in, in, in transitions of, of in, into adulthood that you really see marked gender differ differences. And there are a lot of stereotypes out there. Males very often conceptualised as a threat to society and females threatened by society. We really want to get beneath the, the stereotypes and the, and the norms and assumptions to, to get, get to grips with some of the, the realities on the ground in specific contexts. And I think there's been much interest in adolescent uh, transitions to adulthood. So in terms of males, it's often about preparing them for productive adulthood, specifically to avoid their radicalization and engagement in, in political uprising. There's, a, there's almost a cynical vein running through a lot of the discourse around young males. Similarly, when you look at a lot of the discourse around young females, a strong focus on harmful practices and securing their sexual and reproductive health. And it's often the sexual and reproductive health focus is in order to safeguard future generations, but not necessarily much attention to their lived realities. So that's what we really want to, to, to bring attention to. So just to finalize, we would argue that the field is, is replete with assumptions and stereotypes. I can't think of a better group of people than we have in this room to, to challenge those assumptions and stereotypes and bring to bear some real live evidence to this absolutely fundamental field. So just to, to remind us all that the, the, the 
if you like, the biggest objective of, of the conference is to ensure that we build knowledge for change. More effective policies, more effective um, practice and better research evidence. And with that, I would like to turn to Judith Dears, who is the Chief of Adolescent Development and Participation in the UNICEF's Programme Div uh, Division, and she's going to chair this session. Thank you. We good? No. Hello? 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 Can I just, can you hear me now? I'll just speak. This is a small enough room. So it is such a privilege to be in this room with each one of you at this opening session. So welcome to each one of you. I feel sort of wisdom I know, I know. and experience Sorry. oozing in sake. this room. And I don't think that uh, the organizers know that I began my own wedding by introducing everyone in the room. <laughs> I'm going to resist the urge to do Sorry, so today. Just <laughs> because of the time. Not because each one of you should not be introduced. But I'm going to let those introductions unfold organically throughout the next two days. Do I really need a mic? Up to you. <laughs> I, we, we, yeah, I think we should keep one on, yeah. Okay, and so what I'll do is I will stick to my responsibility to introduce the first speaker um, today. We are so pleased to have Maxine Molyneux with us today. You have her full bio in your uh, packets, so I will not go into all of her experience, but just to say that she currently serves as professor of sociology and was the founding director of the Institute of the Americas at University College of London. And she brings to us today a wealth of experience from academia to advising UN agencies to work with civil society and from the areas of gender to political economy, from Latin America to Yemen. Maxine is the perfect person to start our conversation. And after her initial remarks, we are going to start the conversation among ourselves. So please be prepared with your comments, your questions to both Maxine, to Joe. And I also want to give a big shout out to those in the Munson room. Woo! <laughs> we cannot hear them, but they're in the overflow room. They are also important parts of the conversation. So I would ask that you designate someone over there in the Munson room to collect your questions and comments and bring them over here to be part of the broader conversation. So let the conversation begin and welcome Maxine. Thank you so much, Judith, for those generous remarks. And thanks to Young Lives for this wonderful invitation to speak at this very important conference on adolescence. It's very good to see so many people here, and the program of panels and speakers looks so enticing, it will be very difficult to choose between them. I was asked to speak about gender and poverty, and as someone who has long been involved as an academic, uh, but with one foot in the policy world, I thought I should start off with some observations from a historical perspective, let's say. So looking back over the last four decades of global policy, it's clear that there's been good progress in making female poverty visible and in understanding four critical points, that its causes are multidimensional, that the risk of poverty varies generationally and across the life cycle, and that unequal gender relations contribute to it. Here we've got to acknowledge the crucial role of research 
in providing the evidence that supports these points. Research has not only enriched our understanding of the lived conditions of poverty, but it's also challenged the many misperceptions and myths, stereotypes, that previously govern policy. This greater understanding of the causes of poverty has led in recent years to some progress in actually tackling female poverty. And though slower, it's also led to some progress in creating policies designed to empower and protect the girl child and adolescents, as we will see. But first, a bit of background, because we have to start somewhere. The landmark Gender Policy Conference, let me get my PowerPoints in order here, there we go, was the UN's Fourth World Conference of Women in 1995, which made women's poverty a priority in the platform for action that was agreed at Beijing. This also incorporated specific actions to tackle the discrimination and risks faced by the girl child. Whoops. Hang on a sec. Let's get this back again. Nope, we've gone right to the... Here we go. Uh, sorry about this. It's showing me everything except what I want. Go away. <laughs> yep, okay. Stay there. <laughs> right, so... Um, okay, so, yes, so this uh, Platform for Action, as I said, also incorporated specific actions to tackle the discrimination and risk faced by the girl child, but at, th at that time, remember, the shocking calculations that 100 million women were missing due to sun preference and neglect of girls in Western East Asia had hit the headlines. The plight of girl children reinforced calls for specific measures to tackle gender discrimination and its effects, rather than leaving, you know, things to general development policies that would, it was assumed, eventually bring progress and modernization and sort out all these problems of lagging indicators. Since then, with stops and starts, there's been a growing awareness of the need to address gender-based discrimination. And we can see that as an issue, it has moved from the margins of development policy to being seen as central to it. Getting women and girls out of poverty, empowering them to confront their risks, and equipping them for a role in society has even been seen by some agencies as the magic bullet enabling development. That's girl power for you. This change in awareness is due in part to three main factors, in no particular order. First, to the tireless efforts of gender equality activists, whether in movements and NGOs, or by the often unacknowledged and sometimes disparaged work of feminists in policy agencies like the UN, the World Bank, and so forth. And of course in government departments, struggling in underfunded women's divisions and ministries. The second factor is the global human rights movement that helped bring women's human rights into focus, and in 1979 gave birth to the most far-reaching of women's rights legislation. I have a hard time hearing you read so okay. closer to the mic. Okay, sorry. So the second factor is the global human rights movement and CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women that was passed in 1970. It was adopted by the UN Assembly in 1977, in 1981, and was ratified by 189 states thereby providing activists and sympathetic parliamentarians with a framework to lobby for to address gender justices. CEDAW encodes the principles of full gender equality and substantive rights, that is not just formal rights. It obliges states to take all appropriate measures in all fields to guarantee the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms of women, on a basis of equality with men, and it includes specific articles on equality in political and public life, gender-based violence, education, employment, access to healthcare, marriage, and family law. 
Now, in some parts of the South, for example, Latin America, CEDAW was almost entirely domesticated into national law. But in other regions, notably in the Middle East, it suffered the fate of extensive bracketing and reservations. So it's had a, a, a somewhat rocky, rocky road, but it has made quite a difference. So a decade later, in 1989, the Convention of the Rights of the Child was adopted with 196 signatories. It's fair to say that it achieved and sustained a greater consensus and perhaps fewer reservations, though issues like child labor and provisions seen as eroding parental authority have in some contexts been very contentious. Children's rights NGOs and UNICEF campaigns and other agencies also attracted a, a significant funding which was much less evident in the case of those dedicated to women. But both of these conventions were critically important in establishing a normative and analytic framework for fighting discrimination and encoding uh, widely held aspirations for equality, justice and respect, the core principles on which human rights are founded. Now these two factors, activism and human rights, led to the third, which was the growing responsiveness of the development industry to some gender equality messages. Research showed that two things, gender inequality and ignoring women and girls, often undermined the goals and efficiency of development programs. And the habit of leaving them out of the policy calculus made no sense when they were strategic actors in community and national development. Of course, it was only what Esther Bozerup, way back in the early 70s, had argued in her path-breaking work, Women's Role in Economic Development. Policy shifts take time. Feminist ideas were making some inroads at this time, even though they were adopted selectively. I think that's very important. A critical insight of feminist analysis was the need to factor gender relations into program design and to argue for their centrality in understanding some of the dynamics of female poverty, deprivation, and inequality. Inequality between the sexes, of course, as well as the generations, with societies differing only as to how far these inequalities are sanctioned by law and custom. Such important insights about gender inequalities, generational inequalities, again took decades to enter development practice, and then only in places, only in parts. For example, we know that it took the World Bank until 2012 to publish its first World Development Report dedicated to gender equality and development. Now, these three developments, gender activism, the importance of the human rights movement, and the gradual shift in development policy agendas to more gender equality awareness, resulted in some gender mainstreaming, a bit more budgeting for women's divisions, agencies, ministries, and women gained a, albeit junior seat, at the table of the big development agencies' policy divisions. While these efforts and women's agencies were still under-resourced and often sidelined by many governments, it became more difficult to do nothing. And you had to at least show that you were making some progress in developing gender-sensitive programs. And that pushed things forward a bit. At the same time, with energetic lobbying, especially by UNICEF and some NGOs, to raise awareness about endangered girls, the process of persuading governments to back up their commitments with policies with regard to both women and girls slowly began to bear fruit. And then we come to 2000 and beyond. The new millennium brought a more mixed and in many ways a gloomier global environment. In the aftermath of 9-11, security issues and the spread of conflict zones overshadowed and redirected human rights development agendas. Global women's movement by then had all but dissolved and women's rights were facing a conservative backlash with the rise of more self-confident, illiberal forces and governments. Women's rights, as well as their dress and deportment, became increasingly politicized. 
reproductive rights became a battleground, as to the term gender in UN meetings. Some delegates routinely advanced the Vatican's long-standing attack on the term gender and on feminism in general, supported by otherwise unlikely allies. The unholy alliance, as some called it. These parties were all agreed that gender violated the natural order and that the edicts, and also the edicts of religion. In striking confirmation of this new context after the success of Beijing, with more than 30,000 people attending, no open UN women's conference has since been held for fear of the platform consensus being overturned. Yet, on the positive side, some consensus issues were possible. The Millennium Development Goals provided governments with an impetus to get some urgent things done, even though, as some saw it, MDG 3's gender equality and empower targets fell well short of what was needed to make a difference to women's lives. But more progress was made by the children's rights lobby in this environment, and work on the girl child moved forward with widespread support for getting girls into education. While seen somewhat narrowly as the silver bullet to end gender-based discrimination, nonetheless, already by 2010, at primary level, gender parity had been reached in two out of three countries. And by 2015, girls had achieved parity in primary schooling almost everywhere, while also making great strides at secondary level, in a good number of cases overtaking boys. While the quality of education often left much to be desired, the returns to education for girls were still far lower than for boys too. These gains were still significant. The other important advance brought by the MDGs was in tackling poverty. In making extreme poverty eradication a number one priority, millions of women and girls in the poorest households gained a modest safety net for the first time. The so-called cash transfer revolution brought a raft of positive effects, getting more children into school, improving their health, reducing child work, giving poor households the means to engage again in their communities with dignity, and even allowing some to save or invest in sustainable livelihoods. But the gender story was not all positive. The smart economics case for investing in women and girls because they're key to tackling household poverty or the key to development itself smacks of the old instrumentalism that long characterized approaches to women, where in effect they became mere condu conduits of policy. In the Latin American model of cash transfers, altruistic mothers were made responsible for ensuring that sometimes burdensome conditionalities were carried out. And at least in the first generation of these programs, their own needs were only minimally factored into program design. Indeed, cash transfers were criticized for deepening gender divisions in the home and marginalizing men from the responsibilities of care. Gender equality commitments, it was argued, required more transformative approaches to poverty reduction that provided exit strategies for women rather than as they currently did, reinforcing gender divisions of care. In any event, the positive outcome of all the attention paid to alleviating poverty was that the target of halving extreme poverty was achieved by 2008, well in advance of the target year 2015. Between 2000 and 2008, the MDG campaign claimed that there occurred the fastest reduction of poverty in history, half a billion fewer people living below an international poverty line of $1.25 a day, and child death rates fell by at least 30%. Now, while the commodity boom that spurred economic growth in China, India, and Latin America certainly helped to produce these positive figures, credit is also due to the global spread of cash transfers, which had reached 170 million beneficiaries by 2010. Yet, however effective cash transfers are in alleviating some of the effects of poverty, deeper questions have to be asked about its causes. 
Cash transfers can be seen as a policy response to the adverse social consequences of the global economic model that's been in place for more than three decades. Growing, this, this uh, has been associated, as we all know, with high unemployment, growing informal sector, obscene levels of inequality, and concentration of wealth at the top, along with stagnant or falling incomes for majority populations. In these conditions, poverty is not likely to go away anytime soon. Indeed, with the global financial crisis of 2008 and the prolonged fall in world commodity prices, the decline in extreme poverty has been halted and sadly is now being reversed as households come under increased pressure from unemployment and lower incomes in regions dependent on exports of primary <coughs> products, oil, agricultural exports and so on. Economic downturns also expose the vulnerability of those just above the poverty line, many of whom will join the ranks of the poorest once they've sold what few assets they have, sent more household members into ever more fragile and low-paid employment. With 73% of the global population having limited or no access to social protection, according to UNDP, their vulnerability to falling into poverty at some point is in effect a lifelong risk especially if health fails. Today, let's not forget that one billion people live on less than a pound a day, and another billion are vulnerable to falling into poverty, at least another billion. In such conditions, it's not surprising that once again, the gender gap in poverty is widening. Feminist economists have shown in analyses of the debt crisis that austerity has gendered effects. It deepens gender inequality, both in the labour market and in the home. What Ruth Pearson has called the reproductive burden intensifies and the care deficit grows. Recent reports from the ILO show the proportion of women who will be pushed into insecure jobs could be greater than men, and this, than men's, and this when women are already shouldering the burden of a global gender pay gap of 22%. And in individual countries, as we know, this can be as high as 50%. Poor women suffer from an array of structural disadvantages at work and in the home, where girls and women often suffer from hidden secondary poverty, have less disposable income, accumulate fewer assets, have fewer opportunities and less disposable time due to domestic divisions of labour and authority. But studies of poverty have shown us that income, whether through work or through poverty relief, however important, is a limited instrument for tackling poverty because the condition of poverty is not just about cash or lack of it. If gender is not just about women but is a relational concept involving men and women, boys and girls, and how they interact, poverty is not just about income. From a gender perspective, broader concepts of deprivation are more useful than a focus purely on income levels. We need to understand the multidimensional aspects of gender disadvantage, such as the lack of power to make important decisions that affect one's life, and make visible what goes on inside the household in terms of the division of labour, responsibilities of care, as well as understanding how the gender norms and the legal and cultural forms affect female status and autonomy. In these ways, the secondary poverty of gender and girls is often hidden in simple calculations of household income, which tells us nothing about the specific risks and vulnerabilities that they may be exposed to, such as violence, health and nutritional deprivation among them. This question of risk is perhaps nowhere clearer than in the case of adolescent girls, as we will see. Of course, the term adolescence is not one with sharp definitional and time-based boundaries. It's a broad category which includes the time from puberty to the late teens, but it does connote a stage in the evolution towards adulthood, invoking a graduated process of maturation, which is seen as incomplete. And this has implications for adolescence normative or rights issues, the notion of incompletion, not yet self-standing, not yet autonomous, not admitted as full social members, is crucial in the sense that it implies 
protection through law, through parental authority. But this duality complicates important ideas that are about autonomy, respect, voice, choice, participation, thereby setting up tensions between empowerment on the one side and protection on the other. The classic case of you are old enough to serve in the army and die for your country, but you're not old enough to vote. This transitional age, let's call it adolescence in inverted commas, is a critical time for girls and indeed for vulnerable boys, albeit in markedly different ways. Indeed, it's a time in which gender divisions deepen for both boys and girls. Adolescence correlates with increased risks. Millions die from preventable disease. And that is the sad thing. They are preventable things that they die from. Yet over the past 50 years, adolescence health has improved far less than it has among young children. There's been some success in getting the message across that early years are the key to future development. And of course, more must be done to get more policy commitment on this. But at the same time, awareness must be raised about the critical risk years of adolescence. During this time, adolescent girls experience specific risks which can be life-changing. In particular, the lack of access to safe reproductive health services and information is a major factor accounting for adolescent girls being among the most at risk of dying or suffering from serious or lifelong injuries and illnesses associated with STDs, early pregnancies and childbirth, and undiagnosed reproductive health problems uh, like cervical cancer. Some of the ways in which adolescent girls and boys are especially vulnerable at this time are listed here on the PowerPoint. We have boys and girls are both vulnerable to some of these risks like dropping out of school, early marriage, violence, um, and so forth. But girls, in addition, have these reproductive health risks to contend with, such as early pregnancy and so forth. And it's very sad that girls in high HIV burden countries make up 75% of new infections in Africa, and that's 2013 figures. And millions of girls, and indeed boys, are at risk from a lack of access to safe reproductive health services or indeed reliable information about them. Policies for addressing the harms that adolescents suffer and that help them to maximise their potential have generally been slow to emerge. Most countries still lack age, sex and disability disaggregated data to inform policy, identify gaps and support the allocation of appropriate resources for adolescents. One size fits all, generic policies for women or for children really don't respond sufficiently to the needs of adolescents. Adolescents are also only minimally referenced in the post-2015 agenda, despite their critical role in the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Although the present climate can hardly be described as enabling with its shrinking development funding, attacks on human rights and economic troubles, there is nonetheless some progress in pushing adolescents further up the policy agenda and it is increasingly recognised as an urgent area of policy attention. We see here some of the recent texts that have um, been brought out, and there's a few more, of course, and you'll tell us more about what you've all been doing. But you can see that there's a growing focus on adolescence within the international health and development community, as reflected uh, in some of these recent documents. In June of this year, the CRC has published a report on the special, of the Special Rapporteur focusing on adolescents' right to the enjoyment uh, of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And there's a forthcoming general comment on rights during adolescence being developed by the CRC. So all of these things are really important and welcome developments. Reproductive health is a huge issue for adolescents. And it is both a rights issue in that it maintains the principle that individuals have sovereign rights over their own body and its functions. And it's also a health issue. It figures among the most important and urgent measures that are being advocated by UN agencies. And it's present as target 3.7 of the SDGs. Uh, and this 
wants to see universal access to reproductive health information and services on the basis of non-disclosure. And that's very important in some cult cultures, but has been quite widely resisted. Parental attitudes are slowly changing, and uh, hopefully they will change more. But we also, in terms of the positive uh, side of things, we have seen that the decriminalization of terminations is moving up the policy agenda. The UN Special Rapporteur's report is supportive of this measure, along with urging states to ensure access to modern forms of fertility control, including emergency contraception. These are welcome recommendations which have acquired a tragic urgency in the wake of the Zika e epidemic, and especially in countries where even pregnancies caused by rape of underage girl children cannot be legally terminated. Currently, countries like El Salvador, with the most draconian laws uh, affecting the termination of pregnancies, have imprisoned girls as young as 14 under suspicion of undergoing abortions. This must end. So, to wrap up, along with some positive policy developments regarding adolescence, we're seeing some important changes in young people themselves, which are a cause for hope. As new generations come of age with less limited ambitions than their parents, with new skills and opportunities, a young feminist and human rights revival in parts of the global south appears to be underway, helped sometimes by smart use of social media. Relations between young men and women are changing, and young men can be seen on demonstrations supporting their sisters and girlfriends' protests, for example, at gender-based violence in India, Turkey, Latin America, and elsewhere. These signs of a revival of progressive youth activism is the more hopeful, positive face of the future. But let's not forget that the critical support that it draws upon in the form of the human rights movement is the product of a much longer struggle and one that continues every day. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine, so much for that uh, walk down um, memory lane and for taking us to where we are today and the agenda that is ahead of us. Um, and I appreciate that you mention where we are now with new strategic uh, development goals. And I think from a UN perspective, it is indeed true that they are only nominally mentioned there. I like to say that they are not explicitly mentioned, but are implicit throughout. And I do not think we can achieve any of the SDGs without an adequate investment in adolescence. And I think that's the case that we need to be making going forward. So thank you so much for those remarks. I would like to open immediately to the floor here and in Monson. Hope you can hear me, Monson. Um, and uh, to open up, and I'm gonna take a number of questions at a time so we can really get a sense of the room and what's on people's minds, what has this really triggered in your mind. We may not get a response to one of them, but we have two days to respond to these. So I really want to hear your questions, your comments, um, and what's on your mind. We have, I believe, some roving mics, although I do not yet see them. I can, they are coming. Okay, so um, to start with, maybe you could just speak and I can, um, I can repeat it for those in Monson. Questions, comments? I know many of you and I know you are not shy. Please. And will you please, each of you, this is part of my introduction of everyone, introduce yourself uh, uh, before you ask your question or comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Agnes Mumba. I'm representing a Forum for African Women Educationalists, uh, the Zambian chapter. Uh, my question is to, I'm just curious to learn as to what extent, you know, uh, police um, implementation um, uh, continues to lag behind policy uh, pronouncements and uh, its implication on um, achieving gender equality and equity. Thank you. Oh, 
We now have the mics coming to you in the audience. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm Kelly Holman with the Population Council based in New York. Thank you so much. This is wonderful to be here. Um, Maxine, it's hard to know where to start. Your remarks were just so amazing and powerful, comprehensive. I'm just sitting here with chills. Um, the two things, seriously, the two things that really struck me um, from your talk was the, the hidden poverty that adolescent girls uh, endure and are subject to. And um, I really think that's something that is not made uh, explicit enough in so much of what we do. Um, we, we mention it in certain respects, but I, I think holistically it, that's a term that could really be um, powerful in our field. And then also the fact that adolescent health has lagged behind um, child health in terms of progress in the last 50 years. I think that's one that again we all kind of know underneath, but we don't always say it as um, forthrightly as we probably should. So thank you so much and I really look forward to interacting with you. Should I? Yes, I am Pradeep Chaudhary. I am from JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. I do work on education and labor market in the context of gender, gender and education and labor market. The idea I want to put here is like the, if we see the poverty, particularly in the female poverty, that is predominant in the case where the female labor force participation is very low, particularly in India, where female labor force participation is low and it is also reducing nowadays. Like in the recent data is telling the female labor force participation is the lowest. I think we ranked in the 52 among the countries ranked by ILO, India International Labor Organization. In that case, I want to look at, we have to understand the employer's perspective to that. Actually, how they are treating female in the labor market. Their perspective to females are something different, by which their intention to go to a labor market, even if they are eligible to do that, they are not going to accept the job because of the some hard task of employers. That need to be looked at, and some policy concerns I want to listen on that in the global level. Yep, uh, my name is Paul Stevenson, working for World Vision International. Um, I work uh, or direct the child development and rights uh, team within that organization. Very interested in the uh, piece around cash transfers. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the, where you see the trajectory of cash transfers going and child-sensitive social protection and its impact on adolescents. Many of the programs for cash transfers arguably are directed more at early childhood and access to primary education. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit more about how that can both address and alleviate poverty but also address some of these structural and uh, systemic issues that you uh, alluded to. How does it go beyond alleviation? Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Anju Malhotra, I had gender at UNICEF, um, and I was especially intrigued by your uh, points about the generational and gender organizing principles and how in policy and resourcing over the last uh, two to three decades there's been this uh, uh, mismatch uh, in at some times generational issues have gotten the policy ear, uh, but not money, and at other times, gender issues have gotten the policy ear, but not the money. Uh, and I, I'd be interesting, uh, interested to hear from you where you think we are headed. And uh, adolescence actually is an interesting intersection because children's issues have gotten money, but adolescents aren't always seen as children. And what do you think is more threatening at this point to social and economic change? Uh, change on gender or change on generation? So you need more than five minutes for all those? No, 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 well, so <laughs> over to you, Maxine. Thank you, Judy. Well, what great questions, and, and thanks for your, your kind comments. Um, I think that the issue of what policies lag behind. I think one of the things we're seeing um, is the real shortfalls in health 
a wide range of countries and direct consequences for young people at critical times of their growth. But of course, there are many more and these policies have to be integrated and it's no good just you know, dealing with one aspect of well-being and, and uh, social protection or whatever. You really have to try to deal with um, them in concert, difficult and expensive though that is. Um, the issue of hidden poverty, yes, it's, I think this is a very important way of thinking about it and certainly one, one dimension of the hidden poverty um, effect is health and the way that, uh, again, you know, uh, the sort of difference between the, the risks that boys and girls suffer from, a lot of them are to do with poor access to services, health services, and so on and so forth. So these are things that really need to be highlighted and, and specifically targeted towards adolescent groups who are, of course, highly vulnerable at that stage in their lives. Um, the issue of education, I mean, how do you move from education to the labour market has been a very important area in um, youth research, with lots of countries actually failing to see that that transitional moment is important in securing the livelihoods of young people, particularly from deprived backgrounds. <clears throat> and looking at the research on young people who've gone through schooling, they've got them into schooling, and then they are abandoned just at the point when they have to make it in the labor market. And uh, <clears throat> so we're putting a lot of emphasis on this question of trying to think about that transition from school to work and to think of policies <clears throat> and interventions that would support young people to use their skills development further for their future lives. Um, this question of generation and gender is kind of, yes, I do, I'm not sure one can say, you know, where one should put, you know, the emphasis at any given moment in time. And of course, they're all important. You do see that the policy world changes its focus from time to time. And, you know, certain things that were ignored come into focus, certain things, you know, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, this is the subject of uh, very um, detailed research as to how policy actually is framed, how it changes. There's no doubt in my mind that <clears throat> effective lobbying, social movements, social action uh, has an important role in shifting policy. It's not all done from above, but of course also evidence is extremely important and all of you here have been working very hard in that area. And with evidence, with kind of, especially now, the um, emphasis on value for money, VFM, uh, you know, requires aid effectiveness. And actually that's an entry point into saying your policies won't work until you address these problems. And I think that's, that's an argument that can be used strategically um, to uh, put adolescence on the agenda and to make it clear that if you don't deal with it, nothing's going to work very well. <clears throat> the question of cash transfers, something I've done a lot of work on, I, I think it's, it is uh, important uh, that cash transfers in some parts of the world have responded to the problems of you know, uh, more life course sensitive problems. But that's after an awful lot of lobbying. Take the case of uh, the Mexican program that began as Oportunidades, now called Prospera. Uh, that has um, had uh, uh, attempts through pilots and it's now been incorporated into their mainstream policy to try to um, get young people into skill-based training programs, again, to equip them for the market, labor market, but um, it's very undeveloped. I mean, there are, it's and spotty, but clearly uh, once you've got these young people into school and, and this program in Mexico has done quite well in that regard, the real problem for uh, Mexico is that the quality of that education is, is very, very patchy and very poor in places. But the least program, uh, the program is aware that, that uh, moving more into how do you get adolescents uh, needs more factors into the program it has been happening, albeit somewhat patchily. And I think that's um, very often the case. You have wonderful pilot programs that get applied in certain provinces, and then there isn't the money to follow through. And um, we all know that problem. But I think the argument has been made, and the argument has been taken on board. And I think that's also true with regard to gender. We've seen quite a lot of change in thinking behind cash transfers to give more 
uh, attention to exit strategies um, in regard to, to women. Uh, there are now some programs, again, Mexico's a lead case, which have got uh, childcare programs so that the mothers in the programs can work because it's assumed that mothers don't have anything else to do but look after the children. And that hasn't, of course, not the case because there's other forms of income generating activity that women do that are important. So I see a certain degree of responsiveness in, in the sort of lead sectors of cash transfer program design to accommodate some of these problems but I, I think it will take uh, quite a lot more resourcing and argument to get these things mainstreamed and particularly to put um, adolescent needs firmly on the cash transfer agenda. Thank you. That's it. I'm going to turn this over to Joe but first a quick message to the Munson room. If you have any questions please send them our way and we'll prioritize them in the next round. I'd now like to ask Joe to both respond to the initial marks of, of Maxine and any of the others that you've heard from the audience that you would like to. Okay, I just want to pick up very briefly on, a, I think, a couple of points. And I, I was very struck by um, this idea of hidden, hidden poverty, but I think, I think it goes well beyond that. I mean, I think, and I think that is an important concept that one could use in, in furthering this uh, agenda. So I really like that, that notion that Maxine introduced. And I would want to suggest that one of the problems is precisely with the research. Um, the research that underpins much of what we do globally with young people, really the most, uh, the most important research was, has come out of developmental psychology. And developmental psychology has nothing to say practically about adolescence and youth. It's extraordinarily focused on early childhood. And I just feel that somehow the, the, this, this, this ignorance and la lack of evidence and, and understanding theoretical, uh, conceptual, analytical and empirical of adolescence and youth has just kind of transferred itself automatically into the world of policy. And it's transferred itself more, more seriously, perhaps even, to the global south from the global north. So all the assumptions that are attached to um, early childhood, to child development and to young people's development, uh, development more broadly, really are assumptions of the global north and they've just been transported to the global south. So there's a problem with our research in the first place. Um, and I would then follow on with this, 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 so there is a hidden, there really is a hidden demographic there, um, and one that we need to really get much smarter about um, um, reflecting on in the research and so on. And then I think the second point is, is one of the things that I've observed in going around talking to pra practitioners and policy makers is they are all struggling to find effective platforms for engaging with young people. And it's, whether it's about mental health, physical health, whether it's about entry to the labour market, which was the point that was made, is you know, how, how do you secure their entry into the labour market? And I think this is one of the things that we also need to be addressing in, in this conference. Is so, you know, if young people have already drifted away from school by the age of 12, which is what's happening in many parts of the world, so how do you access them? Where is it? Where is it that they 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 do engage? And of course. As adults, we're often really bad at this anyway, so we're not particularly good at social media. We don't know that we're not well versed in the internet and the technologies that young people are using. And I, I feel as though um, this is another very important reason why young people need to be involved in thinking through the designs and planning of, of interventions and, and so on. Um, and I do like this idea that Maxine made, which is, is the importance of having some kind of a strategic, not just a strategic argument, but a hook to convince others of the importance of working in, in this area. For sure, it's to do with the fact that you need to invest in this, uh, in this generational cohort in order to get the, the, any of the objectives, for example, around the SDGs to, to be achieved and so on. But I think it's, it is a very tough environment at the moment. I think this issue that you raised about um, really the decline in, in, in interest in, in human rights, in women's rights and so on, the fact that that's become so politicized in so many regions of the world makes it really, really hard to, to take forward. So in my experience, it's easier to make an economic argument than it is a human rights argument. And I think I've struggled over many decades working with young people to bring 
uh, children's rights, human rights to the fore in many difficult political environments. But somehow you'll always get politicians and, and ministry officials on board if you say, well, this is not good for the development of your country because you're losing, you're missing out this important generation. It has intergenerational implications as well. So I really wanted to emphasize that point about having a strategic, even if it feels a bit cynical at times, to be using that, you've just got to get people around the table engaging with you. And it's really hard when so much of the, um, so much of the discourse around young people is extremely prejudiced and judgmental and negative. And they, it's, it's going to be a hard sell to turn that discourse around to look at the positives, the amazing contributions that young people make in so many concept, contexts and so many aspects of their lives. Thank you. We have time for a few last burning questions out there that you want to get on to the, uh, onto the table, onto the agenda for these next couple days. Up in the top and then down here in the middle here. Hi, good morning. My name is Agnes Kisumbing and I um, lead a gender research program at IFPRI. It's so nice to um, attach a face to a name, Maxine, after so many years of reading your work. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, to throw out something a little bit provocative, which is that there's been a lot of research on adolescents, and that has usually been linked with adolescent girls. But I think that to change gender norms, we have to bring boys along as well. Um, a lot of the discourse that I see has been on youth and employment. It's always been viewed, or at least in my world, which is the agricultural research world, around employing boys. And then you think about adolescents and girls. And obviously, girls are adolescents and boys are adolescents too. And both of them need to find employment. Um, what can be done to, I mean, this is a challenge, I think, for all of us. What can be done so we can also engage boys and help bring about generational changes in gender norms? Hi there, I'm Brad Kerner at Save the Children, um, where we're schooled on the trailblazing work of Eglantine Jeb. I did not know she was an alumni of, of this, so thanks for that fact. <laughs> uh, Maxine, my, my question is around this idea of uh, the magic bullet that we've been experiencing um, in the investment in girls over the last five years. So you give this great 30, 40 year long history and the movement and then this rapid investment in girls and programming for girls leading to this construct of the magic bullet. So I just want your thoughts on the benefits and the challenges of, of that. I'm Jane Hobson from the UK Department for International Development. Um, and thank you for a very stimulating start to these two days. And my question also picks up on some of the remarks that Joe has made as well. Um, so, Maxine, you very rightly emphasised reproductive rights and the particular risks faced by adolescent girls and also the, the UN battleground where we often feel we're at risk of going backwards on, on some of these issues in particular. Um, for adolescents, sexual and reproductive health and rights are very politicised. Um, we know that there are stigmas, taboos, social expectations, which are some of the biggest barriers to making progress in this area. So I'd be really interested in your comments on that, and particularly from the perspective of the very helpful long view you've just given us on the trajectory we're going on that, if it's possible to answer that, or whether the picture's too mixed, in fact. Thank you. We, I'm afraid, are going to have to close this for now. Here, you, maybe two minutes this time. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. And really, this is, again, the start of this conversation. And don't feel like you've been shut off and it's never heard from again. But this is the beginning of this. And it's been such a very rich one. Thank you. Yeah, great questions again. Thank you very much. Bringing boys in, Agnes, absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, I didn't have time really to talk much about um, the, the dimension of, of involving boys in discussions about uh, issues of reproductive health, about caring about everything, but also in terms of employment divisions. This is very, um, you know, it's, they're quite segmented, these labor markets, and actually to try to break those down is by reskilling people. And, and that's, you know, again, something that requires a lot of investment and care to get um, that sort of 
area of gender segregation employment to be more fluid so boys can be nurses and girls can be engineers you know this is an old argument but it doesn't really seem to be um, you know getting much traction and you know the new technologies which boys are getting into um, girls are being left out so it's a very mixed picture but the kind of gender divisions remain surprisingly resilient although we are seeing quite a lot of uh, movement on the edges which I'm hopeful will become more mainstream as time goes on and more effort is put into that um, it's terribly important that boys and girls see they have common problems actually I mean and and that more efforts are made to address them as as, as generational uh, uh, sort of entities rather than you know only girls only boys and I think some of that is happening magic bullets always a problem we know <laughs> there's always magic bullets it's one thing or another and then we find you know we know already there's all kinds of problems with magic bullets i think it's rather like um, what joe was saying you know there is the issue of of the kind of catchy slogan investing in girls investing in adolescence which you know kind of makes sense you know it's a smart economics argument you know you're going to have a real payoff and um there are reasons to 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 be doubtful that that's carrying the right kind of message about the worth of uh, in, and the, the entitlement of people to be treated properly as full citizens with full rights of integration into their societies it's not just because they're a good investment and it, it's something to do with the economization of social life that we have to think now that all kinds of um, you know interventions have to be justified as economically appropriate and it goes back to the value for money it goes back to all of those things but you know used by some people in a way that can levy resources and can actually change the the practice and make sure that good things are done under that umbrella however distasteful it might appear for those reasons maybe you know just has to be done that way for a while um, the issue of uh, sexual and reproductive rights very difficult as you say and so diverse in terms of regional complexities even community level complexities i'm not sure there's um, a simple answer to that clearly um, emergency contraception has um, given all kinds of adolescents an avenue to control their fertility and um, you know we have also seen interesting progress in countries where you know, for reasons of Catholicism or other religions, there's a prohibition on contraception, but emergency contraception in Latin America, even in countries that don't allow abortion, will be allowed and is distributed. Take Brazil, for example. This is making a huge difference to young women. If they know it's there, if they know they can afford it, if the services are not um, just siphoning them all off and selling them privately and all the usual things that go on. But you know, there is that avenue which is um, important and, and I guess all the levers we have for getting into the health discussion, if we can get adolescents more involved in that, that can be a way of opening up all sorts of issues. Also about, you know, this kind of very difficult question to mainstream is sex education. How do you teach it? How do you do it properly? How do you get adolescents to want to be involved? You know, there's a lot of questions and that's about the very sensitive programming and really that can only be done on the ground, it seems to me. But thanks very much for the question. I have been remiss in seeing one person who's hiding behind the podium here with uh, eager for a question. So I am going to... Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I'm, uh, uh, what Joe said, that we must include boys, and especially, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Suti Kakkar. I'm chairperson of the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights India. We behave, we act like a regulator in a way. You know, see if there are any grievances and things. It's a statutory body. People come to us, grievance redressal, see that laws, and we have many that, uh, there in India implemented properly. But uh, what Joe said about boys, including boys, and that they fall out of the educational system most, uh, I mean, girls is well known, and we all know the reasons. But boys are also falling out of the educational system, and what's happening to them, we don't know. So my worry at the moment is i mean it's an issue which i've been looking for answers and i'm sure i'll be able to find it here because i'm i've been a practitioner but now i'm talking to the doyens in you know education who have done so much research work on it 
So there is a problem of uh, crimes being committed by adolescents. And what our National Crime Record Bureau statistics show is that most of these crimes um, registered against children are boys, 95%. Girls are about 5% or less. Or maybe they're doing some other kind of crime, maybe prostitution or something that doesn't really come in that kind of a heinous crime thing, serious crime that needs, uh, imp I mean, some kind of punitive action. And that's basically they are in the ages of 17 to 18, 16 to 18 years. Now, I believe what the psychologists tell us that they are retrievable, these children, and that's why we need to work more on these children. Uh, Maxine, I would like uh, your advice on this, on how do we go about it? Because, you know, in India, even 1% is a huge figure. And then we did have to change, amend our Juvenile Justice Act, you know, because of that, uh, that Nirbeha rape crime, which sort of shook everybody, the kind of brutality. But these crimes are happening every day. What to do about these children? And I have visited many observation homes. I've tried to understand, but uh, somehow, what is the answer? Okay, we want many answers from Maxine. Unfortunately, we're going to carry those over um, to coffee. Do you have it quick? All right, she has the answer. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if only, if only. No, I was going to say all of you will have the answer, but I just had one point I wanted to make, is that the answer, or one answer, is not to do what some countries are doing, which is to take the hard line and to bang these kids up and to treat them very badly. Um, this is really not the answer, and it's very tempting for governments to think it is. In Latin America, we call it the mano duro, the hard hand. It doesn't work. So, you know, and the, the, the reasons that these young people are in there are very, very... There, there are lots of reasons. It's not just one, and there's no one solution to it. Thanks. <laughs> and I will not attempt to have a summary of the session here at the end, but do want to say that it is often that the economics and rights arguments line up, and it's often that you can say it's the right and smart thing to do, and I think it's important that we bring those together when that does happen, because that's a win-win. And I'd also like us to think, as we move forward in these next two days, to really go beyond building knowledge for change, and that we think big and bold here for knowledge for transformation. And thinking about transforming these societies where girls can fulfill their potential and have full mobility and voice, and boys are not constrained by these uh, masculinities that can be so narrow and oppressive. And that we indeed find ways to partner with adolescents and take advantage of their passion and their sense of outrage and intolerance for inequities and discrimination in their own communities. That is the power we need to seize as uh, we adults can merely partner with them and help them realize their vision for a just society. So I hope we can really take this seriously in our programming, in our research, because that is the only way um, for this kind of transformation. So I look forward to these next two days. I am so excited. And um, let's go on for coffee. Two doors over. Where, just through there, where there will also be um, poster presentations as well. So a, a two for coffee and stimulation of the intellectual type. So thank you all for a great first session.